Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. Uh, today I'm speaking with Kia Kreutler and Arun McMillan. They are co-founders of Gnosis Guild. And today we'll be diving deep into uh, DAOs, DAO infrastructure, DAO tooling, and sort of looking at um, the, 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 the breadth of things that people are doing with DAOs and what DAOs might reserve for the future. But before we talk to Kia and Arun, I'd like to tell you about our sponsors this week. Are your crypto assets sitting idle in your wallet? Start earning rewards and contribute to network security by staking with Course One, A staking provider securing $5 billion in assets on over 25 decentralized networks, including Solana, Cosmos, and Ethereum. Course One has released the annual staking review for the year 2021. It contains over 70 pages of insights and analysis into some of the most important proof of stake networks right now. You can go to course.one and download the report for free. And if you've been a loyal Solana delegator with Course One, make sure to check your wallets. In the first ever major NFT drop by any validator, Course One airdropped over 3,600 exclusive NFTs to its Solana delegators. Uh, according to their delegation profile in December of 2021. The NFTs are also available on the secondary market on platforms like Magic Eden. But if you missed on this airdrop, don't worry. You can still participate in the upcoming airdrops for Cosmos chains by simply delegating to Chorus One nodes. If you're interested in running your own branded nodes, well, they have a managed white label Nord as a, node as a service offering that leverages Chorus One's highly available and proven infrastructure enabling you to participate directly in decentralized networks. So head over to chorus.one to start your staking journey. And we're also brought to you by Paraswap. With Paraswap, you can beat market prices every single block. It's fast, highly liquid, and they just launched their E5, which has new contracts and a new API. It has a more modular infrastructure, uh, which is more gas friendly and now supports free approvals using Ethereum's permit messages. They also recently added support for Avalanche, Polygon, and BSC. And you can always use Paraswap with your ledger right in Ledger Live. So go to paraswap.io to get started. Kia and Arun, thanks so much for joining me today. I'm really excited about this episode. I, I spent the whole day uh, just like reading. I had like a million tabs open, reading like everything I could about um, about DAOs, DAO infrastructure, so like DAO theory and collaboration theory on the internet. And uh, I think this is going to be like a really, um, really cool episode. So thanks so much for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having us. Really excited to be here. So um, yeah, let's let's perhaps start a little bit with uh, some introductions. Um, you know, how, how did you guys get into crypto, and what's your background, and how do you uh, come to be working on DAO tooling at Gnosis? Cool. So hey, also thanks for having us on. And I'm Kia. Uh, I'm actually a writer, artist, and former kind of front end developer. Um, I've been mainly interested in how cultural narratives of technology shape their use. So I had a kind of long path through working on more open source projects, open source mapping projects, a lot of kind of more grassroots tech initiatives. And I've been following Ethereum and kind of the crypto space for a while. And I was really interested in like what a site of experimentation it seemed like. So I think I was like passing through Berlin in 2014 and I ended up at Wikimedia, which was a space where they'd often hold meetups. And it was before Ethereum launched and it was basically a bunch of people trying to set up an early kind of client for Ethereum. And I'm not sure if any of us managed to get it working, um, but there was a particular energy to that event that I think was not present in most of the tech meetups that I would go to at a time. And it wasn't clear that it would be successful. It wouldn't be clear that it would be speculated upon. It was real just kind of renewed emphasis on forms of computation that were decentralized, that were private, hopefully, and also that could really kind of change how not only software or finance operates, but how organizations operate. So I followed Ethereum for quite some time, um, basically kept a tab on after the launch and as projects were built on it. And then I joined the space full time in 2017 at Gnosis. Um, so I've been there the last over four years and I've always had more of a focus on kind of what organizational change it will bring. So I've been really lucky to work with Orin um, and basically co-found Gnosis Guild, which has been incubated by Gnosis to focus on governance and DAO tooling. And I, uh... I guess I stumbled into the blockchain space in, in 2013. Uh, I, I saw a, a news article on, uh, on the deep web, the dark web, and, and kind of started poking around uh, Tor browser and found my way onto, onto various kind of marketplaces, 
everything was denominated in this weird Bitcoin thing. And so that, that kind of was the start of the rabbit hole, trying to figure out what that was and, and why it was valuable and why people were kind of selling stuff on the deep web for Bitcoin. Um, and I guess like shortly after that, I found my way to, to a bunch of Vitalik's reasonably early uh, writing. And the thing that kind of immediately captivated me there were some of his early pieces on DAOs, uh, on the concept of DAOs. Um, I was playing basketball professionally at the time, and so that that was eating most of my time. Um, but this this kind of seed just grew and slowly consumed more and more of my uh, my bandwidth over the, the kind of subsequent few years. And uh, then in 2016, uh, the DAO project kind of sprung up, and I immediately just kind of immersed myself in that. Uh, founded the the DAO Hub Forum, um, which kind of became the de facto home for the DAO's community. And uh, and that kind of snowballed into uh, a full-time career in, in DAOs, uh, in all things DAOs. Uh, so kind of, yeah, went through this, this meteoric rise and catastrophic fall of the DAO. And then from that, uh, I uh, did a whole bunch of work with, with various different projects in the space, uh, kind of early on, Gnosis included back in 2017, and then spent some time with uh, with Colony for a couple of years as well, and then back to Gnosis um, uh, a few years back. And uh, yeah, since since being there, I uh, have helped launch the Gnosis DAO and now founded uh, Gnosis Guild with, with Kia to, to focus on Zodiac, this new kind of... I guess, standard and uh, suite of tooling for kind of composable, interoperable DAOs. Cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely like uh, associate with, uh, you know, with what you're saying in terms of like being, feel, feeling like full, fully encapsulated by this new concept and this new technology. I mean, I remember early in the early days around 2014 and 2015, I think one of the things that I found the most interesting about Bitcoin and Ethereum was that you know, I, we didn't really have the word DAO then, but, you know, there was this concept of like those those things like, you know, those blockchains within in themselves being autonomous and um, and being sort of organizations of people that were maintaining the ledger. And uh, and I think that for a lot of people that, you know, really resonated with them. And um, and then, you know, there's I think the first time that I ever kind of um, in, encountered this concept of, you know, autonomous sort of agents. Uh, was uh, an early Mike Hearn talk from 2013 or 2014, where I think he's at some Google event and he's describing this world where we have autonomous vehicles that are sort of self-owning and they're able to like you know buy their own energy and get on fast lanes and pay for things and receive payment and even like spawn off like new cars like by ordering new cars to sort of you know uh, uh, build build their self-driving business and and. That just blew my mind, and I, I think that's what really got me excited about this whole space and about DAOs in general. Um, you know, what excites you the most about DAOs, and what would you say is like the the sort of cutting edge uh, of like DAO technology today? Like, what what are the most innovative things that people are doing with DAOs? So I think the I don't know the, maybe meshing the answer of both of those questions into one the, the thing that kind of excites me most i think the kind of real cutting edge of DAOs, uh is the the potential and kind of reality of systems that uh, produce some desired outcome from as an emergent result of kind of uncoordinated inputs and so you talked about uh say the bitcoin network or the ethereum network being these uh early instantiations of DAOs, you know in large part before the the kind of concept or at least like the um the, the word DAO was was in in ready circulation um but these networks are, are most certainly DAOs uh, and they're, they're DAOs with these kind of very very tightly scoped uh roles or very tightly scoped kind of outputs that are, are very carefully engineered to be uh the result the kind of emergent result of a whole bunch of uncoordinated actors kind of providing inputs to the system and i think there's this huge design space for uh, essentially engineering other uh, outcomes as emergent results from uncoordinated inputs. Uh, quadratic voting, quadratic funding in particular, I think are two great examples of this where you have uh, in quadratic funding's case, the kind of desired outcome is a well allocated pool of capital to some, some sector of public goods. 
And the way that you kind of arrive at that, uh, that allocation is from the uncoordinated inputs of people contributing to projects that they value. And I think kind of uh, generalizing that idea of, of finding some desired outcome and then engineering a way to to reach that outcome through uncoordinated inputs is uh, is going to be really crucial for DAOs to continue to kind of achieve the the scale that uh, I think a lot of people are hoping DAOs are going to be able to, as in uh, push beyond the kind of theoretical or practical limits of of kind of more traditional firms. Yeah, and likewise, building on that, I think it's interesting uh, that you kind of wrote DAOs in terms of its autonomous quality, because I think that that's a quality that is much less emphasized today. Um, we see it with kind of distributed ledgers, but in a lot of the social DAOs or even some of the protocol DAOs operating today, it's much less at the forefront than it used to be. Because I would give a kind of early definition of what the idea of a DAO was as something like an organization with automation at its center and humans at the edges. So the idea that actions like how capital could be released or how protocol functions happen um, in an autonomous manner. Um, and I think it gave root to a lot of interesting imaginations like, you know, DACs for kind of natural systems or DODANs in the same way that we see legal personhood given to rivers and coral reefs, et cetera. And a lot of that discourse has kind of faded into the background, but I wholly expect it to reemerge in the next couple of years as DAO tooling starts to mature. Um, what I'm most excited about is actually the kind of cultural ramifications of DAOs, um, because I feel like it's kind of captured an energy of activism as well as um, maybe not autonomous in the technical sense, but autonomous in a more kind of approach to political organizing, that groups can have a kind of more grassroots approach, but still have um, as much, if not greater than impact of kind of traditional firms or let's say corporations that operate at larger scales. Um, so I'm really excited about just the kind of good hearted energy going into the space um, and really confident that um, people with kind of more political science minded or essentially more social science minded um, can guide some of the DAOs towards these better outcomes or to more impactful outcomes. Of course, there are always um, flops along the way and hilarious kind of missteps, but I think it's promising much more so than other spaces that I see people working in today. That's a really interesting uh, uh, way to look at it. I, I, I guess, I guess we, I, I still think of it as a decentralized autonomous organization, but you're right. Like a lot of the, the DAOs that we see, you know, uh, sub, being summoned today and, and sort of organizing today are, are more just organizations of humans, you know, working together towards a common goal than something that's fully automated. And I think like, er, you know, the early DAOs, like the DAO maybe had more of, uh, of this philosophy of like fully automating, you know, for instance, like a, a fund in, in, in a sense. And it was less so about like this grassroots sort of effort. Um, you know, when, when you think of something that's, uh, you know, grassroots and that that you know, brings together lots of different people. You think of cooperatives, and I wonder what are the parallels in your view? Like, what are parallels between cooperatives as we as we know them? Like, you know, in, in most jurisdictions, you have like you know a, 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 a stat like a, um, a sort of legal uh, status for for a, for a co-op or a cooperative. In France, it's like a you know a société de coopérative or something like that. In Germany, we have the same thing and. So what, what are the overlaps between DAOs and cooperatives as you see them? Sure. So in a recent essay, A Prehistory of DAOs, I gave one definition of a DAO that doesn't definitely does not apply across the space, but potentially a kind of voluntary association that prioritizes, let's say, the operating principles of cooperativism. Um, so when people are talking about co-ops, they actually usually mean a specific legal structure with democratic member control and economic ownership. Um, I say that DAOs prioritize them as operating principles, um, basically to shift the space towards because, well, basically because it's a, they could emphasize co-ownership of contributors to the DAO. It's quite easy for those um, who are contributing to um, be able to have greater economic stake in what they're producing. And this isn't something that we always see with traditional firms. Um, so I think that DAOs have the propensity to be kind of hyper-capitalism but they also have a different propensity to be kind of member owned. And basically by giving these definitions and patterns, we can encourage them to go more towards the space. Um, and just maybe a, a kind of more meta note on that level is that I think that we're at a, at a stage where we can kind of put these patterns in place and say, hey, you should really look at how ownership is playing out in your DAO because right now that's critically what's being determined. 
both ownerships within DAOs and also across DAOs, so ownership and crypto networks. And that basically by prioritizing co-ownership right now, we can make sure that it doesn't become too, too lopsided in the future and that more DAOs take this to heart. And I think one last note on that is that um, there's also been a criticism in the kind of overlap of DAOs and co-ops that um, the kind of mistaken belief that cooperativism or kind of co-ownership or democratic control, um, how can that touch the kind of base layer of global capitalism that crypto kind of glides on top of? And I really think it's about a deep understanding of how technology develops and the cultural norms and basically pushing cultural norms at the right time. And right now, DAOs and co-ops seem from like the recent FWB piece called um, what can like DAOs and co-ops learn from each other, as well as, um, this is a long-winded response, but as well as other pieces like um, Morshed Manan's earlier work on DAOs and co-ops that I think is really important, but really has only kind of come to visibility and it's right time now. So he wrote this 2018 paper um, called Fostering Worker Cooperatives with Blockchain Technology. And basically in it, he looks at the difference between a capital managed firm and a labor managed firm, and also the Colony project. So Colony is a DAO platform. Um, they've recently launched a new phase. Um, and so back in 2018, um, Morshed was writing about this and basically saw fundamental challenges that a lot of these labor managed firms had. Um, one was that they had difficulty bootstrapping funding sometimes for good reasons, because it limits the amount of private investing. Um, they also had problems of kind of operating across different jurisdictions, and they also had problems of operating at scale. And basically by looking kind of closer at the colony platform, he said, you know, maybe, maybe just maybe um, these tools that are cross jurisdictional that help with kind of alignment or coherence um, would be able to aid cooperatives to be able to grow into a more global movement. Yeah, that, that, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I, I think perhaps like w when I think of cooperatives and like the people who are in cooperatives, like, I, you know, I, I I think that there's this there's such a rejection of, you know, of, of hyper capitalism or even just capitalism and the the images that sort of blockchain and crypto conjures up, I think, in those people's minds just like totally uh, goes in opposition with, um, you know, what I think a lot of cooperatives um, goals are. And so, you know, there. I think there may be also like a generational thing where like increasingly co -op, what, what we see as cooperatives, you know, today, is like traditionally cooperatives may start forming into DAOs as, uh, you know, the people in those that form those groups are uh, more inclined to, you know, uh, scale like beyond the boundaries of like, you know, you know uh, national borders and jurisdictions and things like that and like seek funding and this sort of thing. I'd like to ask you, like, maybe just take a step back here first and like, in the sort of brief history of, of DAOs on Ethereum, can you describe sort of the arch of like how DAOs have uh, evolved from like, you know, the initial, the DAO, which I think is the most emblematic DAO, a lot of people sort of re remember as being like the first DAO to some more recent ones like Moloch DAO, uh, which, you know, inspired a lot of uh, subsequent DAOs and like, now this sort of explosion of DAOs that are doing everything from you know, buying NFT portfolios to um, you know funding projects uh, to funding development. You know, what what does the sort of like history of DAOs look like? Yeah, I think Kia has some really great insights uh, on this in her prehistory of DAOs uh, article. So definitely worthwhile people checking that out. In terms of uh, maybe just a, a quick overview of, of the history of say like DAO frameworks and technologies and whatnot yeah the obviously i think uh the cryptocurrency kind of networks uh bitcoin and ethereum and and, and a whole bunch of others to me are, are the first kind of really widespread instantiations of kind of DAO like organizations uh, in terms of uh i guess the other kind of broad category of DAOs, these kind of less tightly scoped more uh organizational DAOs as opposed to kind of really uh, really tightly scoped uh, participation in terms of a you know being a, a miner or a validator uh, in in this uh, protocol style DAO. Um, yeah, the the DAO I think was was probably the first uh, or at least one of the the first kind of instantiations of uh, of this type of DAO. Um, it was essentially a, a, a yeah, mutual pool of capital that uh, the intent was to allocate it and I think intend to uh, you know, attempt to kind of earn a, a return on it in some way. Uh, it was fairly loosely defined uh, by design, just that I think it very much wanted that to be a, uh, an emergent thing for the, the community to decide what they wanted to do with this pool of funding. Um, it was a, a reasonably 
complex system, at least for the time. Uh, and and uh, that is, is kind of part of the reason that it ended up uh, having kind of an, an undiscovered exploit that, that ultimately had it crash and, and burn. Uh, and so Moloch was this kind of direct reaction to that this deliberately very simple con- contract with very simple mechanics that allowed uh, participants to very easily uh, recover their share of the capital and leave at any point in time. Uh, the, the, the kind of key innovation for, for Moloch was this rage quit mechanism. Uh, so you, as a member of a Moloch DAO, have uh, shares and you can redeem those shares for uh, a relative portion of the um, of the DAO's assets at any point in time. Um, and then around that, mechanics that allow you to uh, to do that at kind of critical moments. Whenever the DAO passes a decision, you have a, uh, a cool down period where you can rage quit uh, if if you disagree with how the uh, how the decision went. Um, uh, kind of in parallel to that, uh, a whole bunch of other uh, DAO frameworks kind of sprung up and, and kind of developed in parallel for for several years. Aragon, DAO Stack, and Colony were the kind of primary uh, examples uh, that that spun up kind of around the same time. I think Colony actually started building slightly before the DAO, but uh, has has kind of been in development for a, a great many years. And Aragon spun up kind of shortly after the DAO. Uh, DAO stack, uh, similarly, I think shortly after the DAO, I think at the time it was called, oh, I'm, uh, I'm drawing a blank now on what it was. It had a different name, but, uh, nevertheless, the, these kind of three, three kind of separate approaches to, uh, to creating DAOs, uh, Aragon very much kind of designed as a, as an operating system for DAOs, uh, DAO stack kind of more opinionated on, on what the decision-making mechanism was introduced a, a kind of novel decision-making mechanism in holographic consensus, uh, which is essentially combined uh, uh, token-weighted voting and prediction markets to kind of modulate what the uh, what the quorum for those votes should be. And then Colony uh, introduced a really interesting uh, reputation mechanism where you earn reputation for contributing uh, to the organization and the kind of organization gets to define what reputation means within the context of that organization. Um, I think uh, later on, uh, Compound uh, kind of made the the realization that most of the DAO frameworks were much more complex than what they needed uh, to govern the Compound protocol, and so ended up deciding to roll their own uh, in the Compound governance framework. And the big, uh, I don't know, innovation uh, that they made was not really an innovation at all, but kind of a revival of a, of a centuries old security technique and just having a time lock, uh, you know, having having a, a window of time where things are queued up before they execute uh, and and making sure that you have a way to kind of respond to things um, in advance of them being executed. Um, and Compound being a kind of relatively simple on-chain mechanism for governance uh, proved to be a, a Kind of winning combination for a whole bunch of uh, protocols um, until gas prices uh, started skyrocketing, uh, at, at which point um, we, we started to see uh, projects take kind of different uh, different approaches to kind of mitigating that. And I think that largely the the, the most popular approach was to uh, essentially push voting off chain and, and kind of delegate the actual control to a kind of relatively smaller group of multi-sig signers uh, or in Compound's case to delegate vote weight to larger kind of protocol politicians that um, that would uh, were financially incentivized to, to or at least had enough stake to to justify the gas cost of voting on chain. Uh, I have totally glossed over the, uh, the whole kind of Moloch ecosystem that evolved beyond the original Moloch DAO as well. Uh, the, the DAO house guys uh, spun up a Moloch v2 and an interface for that. And that um, on XDI, which is now Gnosis Chain, became the kind of home for a whole whole kind of class of uh, of DAOs. Um, and then, yeah, over the, the last maybe uh, year or so, there's there's been a whole bunch of uh, more, uh, I don't know, more tightly focused or, or, or kind of uh, just different styles of DAO frameworks uh, starting to emerge. Uh, a lot of them built on top of and around the Nosa Safe as a core, uh, and this is largely what we've been trying to uh, 
uh, trying to to standardize and accomplish with the Zodiac framework. Yeah, there, there's so much to unpack here, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the notice to save I think has been like you know, instrumental to you know, the success of, and I mean, the 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 ease of of of, um, of you know, people's ability to uh, to summon DAOs, um, as well as like all of these different frameworks that you mentioned. Um, you know, one of the things that you know came up in you know researching this episode and like talking to, with people who um, you know who have been working you know, a lot more closely than I have in like summoning DAOs and things like that is that there's like an abundance of tools and like in my research I was able to find like lots of different frameworks like you know um, and um, you know what, what what is the overlap between some of these tools and you know are we arriving at some standards um, on uh, you know how we um, how we construct DAOs and um, what you know is, is this abundance a good thing or does it end up actually like making things a bit more complicated in the end for people who are uh, building DAO infrastructure or building DAOs? Uh, I think it's definitely a good thing. I mean, choice uh, and kind of plurality of options is is great because it's a it's a good kind of forcing function for um, for tools to to develop in a way that actually serves users needs um, uh, and serves, serves people's uh, you know real world requirements uh, it obviously makes it more complex for someone new to the space coming in and trying to figure out what to do figure out uh, uh, what uh, what framework kind of works will work well for them or, or kind of how they should go about making decisions um, but uh, nevertheless I think that uh, yeah that abundance of choices is, is a net positive. Um, it's definitely part of what inspired uh, Zodiac as a framework, uh, trying to find a way to, uh, I guess, mesh all of those things together in a way, or at least have a, a kind of common way for them to play nicely together. Um, probably worth giving a, a quick bit of backstory on that um, to, to help kind of illustrate why. Um, so in, I guess, late 2020, we started doing some research to figure out what the uh, essentially how, how we should set up the Gnosis DAO. Uh, we, we had this desire to move a huge chunk of Gnosis's treasury into something that was community controlled um, and had a couple of really key kind of requirements. One was that it would be uh, well, well kind of proven to secure vast amounts of funding. Um, two, that we don't kind of unreasonably restrict participation. We don't price people out of participation. Um, and three, that we don't kind of unreasonably restrict our, our future choices. We don't lock ourselves into, into kind of one particular roadmap because of a choice that we make early on. Uh, and we realized that none of the existing frameworks uh, really checked all three of those boxes. Uh, and the third one, I think, is, is relevant to what we're talking about here in terms of unreasonably restricting us, uh, our, our kind of future choices. And so you imagine a scenario where, say, I'm brand new to the space and I come in and I discover Aragon. And I say, wow, this is this amazing DAO tool. I'm going to go and go and create a DAO. And then after six months of, of operating the DAO space and, and having built up a community uh, using this Aragon DAO, the community decides, hey, actually, we'd, we'd really love to use a Moloch DAO. Moloch is much, much more suitable for, for our style of organization. And so we want to migrate. And so the migration process now is essentially they've got to spin up this new Moloch DAO uh, kind of populate it with with all of the users, and then go through this kind of arduous process of making proposals to transfer all of the tokens and all of the systems that uh, that this DAO controls. You know, if it's the owner of any other external systems, uh, to update any kind of external references to that DAO, uh, probably on a bunch of websites they don't control. And so there's this kind of really monumental coordination challenge of moving from one framework to another. Uh, and so the kind of key insight that we had with Zodiac was that if we decouple your account and the mechanism that controls it, we can make that migration process much less painful. Where if you imagine as a, as a new organization, you come in and you spin up a Gnosis safe, and then you say, hey, we, we really love Aragon. We want Aragon to be the, the mechanism for our DAO. Um, then... Uh, we plug an Aragon DAO into our NOSA safe and have the Aragon DAO control the safe. But then same thing, if six months down the road, the community now decides, hey, we'd really like to be uh, a Moloch DAO, then we simply, with kind of one proposal, are able to uh, plug in this new Moloch DAO as a module to our safe, unplug the Aragon DAO, and now all of a sudden, we, we are a Moloch DAO rather than Aragon DAO, 
none of our assets had to move. None of our kind of owner uh, settings on any uh, systems we control had to be updated. None of the external references to our DAO had to be updated. It all kind of happens in one step. Um, so we we kind of are much less restricted in our kind of future decisions by our current decisions just through that simple uh, simple decoupling of your account and control mechanisms. Uh, right. So so essentially, the accounts are and, and the and the and the governance tools and all of the other tools where people interact with the with the DAO are sort of like decoupled in this stack. Um, can you describe like the well? You know, before we go into the stack, maybe describe what is Zodiac, and then you know, perhaps we can talk about like the different layers in the stack and how you guys are looking to modularize a lot of those uh, aspects. Yeah, so Zodiac is is really the I don't know materialization of of our uh, of this kind of key insight, right? That uh, by decoupling these things, we we enable a whole world of possibilities uh, on on how you design and build. Uh, DAOs. So Zodiac is really this kind of standard for and, and kind of set of tools built to the standard, uh, standard for uh, essentially how to build these composable and interop interoperable pieces of DAO tooling. Uh, and so when I say DAO tooling, this could be the existing kind of DAO frameworks that, that are kind of relatively large monolithic uh, DAO-like structures, or it could be much more granular pieces of uh, tooling for enabling specific functionality. And the nice thing with uh, this particular way of building DAOs is the two aren't mutually exclusive. You can have multiple mechanisms running in parallel being used for different types of decision-making within the context of one organization. So uh, yeah, the Zodiac is really just this, this standard for composable DAO tooling. Um, it's, it's a specific kind of set of contract interfaces that if you expose them, then uh, you, you're now kind of you can you can play nicely with all of the other tooling. It's um, a kind of library that basically has a programmable account at the center. Um, we've built a lot of the interfaces around the Gnosis Safe because we know it's a trusted account and it's extendable open source, um, but fundamentally framework agnostic. And our tools mainly can be used through the Zodiac app on Gnosis Safe. And what I like about kind of being able to kind of combine plug and play and staff them and also connect them to other DAO platforms. So not just the safe, it can be a MOLA, it can be basically anything you dream of, um, is that it kind of, you know, we saw with recent criticisms of Web3 that there's still platform centralization, even if there's potentially protocol decentralization. And we don't want to mimic with the platforms that we build the same type of kind of um, user centralization that we've seen with Web2 or other platforms. So by kind of having participants in DAOs get used to kind of plug and play their own framework where you can add a module that allows you to connect, say, a MOLA DAO on Gnosis Chain to a Gnosis Safe, um, but also to maybe add a delay modifier so that you have a time before transactions can be executed. We'll go deeper into the stack, but basically being able to set these up and add qualifiers to all the mods reorients, I think, both on a protocol level, but also on a platform participant or user level, um, the kind of relation to the tools that we use for DAOs. So it's the idea that we can put kind of small components together to make custom setups we're not locked into one monolithic platform, and we're not stuck there because everyone's using the same platform. So Zodiac is really about building bridges in the same way that protocols were about decentralization. The Zodiac approach is almost um, kind of a platform decentralization approach to how we do governance in the future. It is really an antithesis to a lot of the kind of platform governance or democratic governance tools that we saw that over -anticip really anticipated use cases in the past. We wanna let use cases emerge and then build the bridges to them. That's really cool. So, so Gnosis Safe sits at the middle of this, and then um, this is integrated, you know, as as a, as a as a UI sort of like in the Gnosis Safe interface. Um, can you talk about the different modules that you've built and like what people can like what flavors that people can sort of like put into their into their uh, into their Zodiac um, DAO? Yeah, I think one uh, key thing that, that Kia mentioned that's worth reiterating there is that we, we kind of use the safe as our prototype for this, as the prototype for uh, what we call the avatar, as in like the, the thing that represents the DAO on chain. Um, but it is fundamentally uh, agnostic to what that avatar is. So if someone else wanted to write some different contract to, to, the, to, to function as an avatar, to function as that, that programmable account at the center, they absolutely could. Uh, and we, we think that this is a, a really important thing um, 
to to just be explicit about because we we want this to be a, a kind of open standard. We want it to be something that other people feel free to to come and build on top of, and we don't want to again to kind of unreasonably lock people into. Uh, any one specific solution. We obviously think that the safe is the best solution, uh, and that's why we we use it as our as our prototype. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's 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 a wide open standard there, and anyone can can kind of implement whatever they like. Um, in terms of the the pieces that we've built, uh, we have a handful of um, a handful of kind of additional modules and modifiers that we've uh, built on top of this uh, to basically try to extend. Uh, what what the DAO ecosystem is able to do in some cases, and other, in other cases, just provide what we think are some fundamental building blocks. Um, we've deliberately avoided, for the most part, uh, replicating work in terms of uh, voting and decision making tools, because for the most part, they 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 already exist. There's a whole bunch of really great DAO tools out there in in Aragon and Moloch and DAO Stack and Colony and Compound, uh, and so we we didn't necessarily feel the need to. Uh, to try to replicate those things. But we do have a handful of uh, other tools that we've built that, again, feel like kind of fundamental building blocks. Um, the The first one was was very much kind of needs driven, was the thing that uh, kicked off this, this whole endeavor uh, is our, our reality module. And it's what underlies uh, the, the safe snap plugin for Snapshot, which basically lets you take an off-chain vote from Snapshot and bring it on-chain to trigger kind of on-chain execution. Um, so there's a, a bit of a, a confusing layer of names here uh, in terms of Snapshot, the kind of voting platform, SafeSnap, the, the kind of plug-in to Snapshot, and then the reality module that lives underneath it that then plugs into the Nosa Safe. Uh, there is a, a very good justification for the, the separation of all of these names, but it does uh, it does lead to a bit of confusion. Um, so maybe uh, maybe we can dive into that really quickly, but yeah, essentially, like at a high level, what this does is let you take off-chain uh, votes and uh, bring them on-chain. Uh, the reality module is is kind of the uh, the key to this uh, thing working, and it plugs into uh, basically or the way that it brings off-chain voting on-chain is via an oracle called reality.eth. Uh, hence the name, the reality module, because we're plugging into this reality.eth. Uh, Oracle, uh, reality.eth is is this really cool Oracle mechanism that is not very widely kind of known about or understood. So it's worthwhile diving into quickly. It essentially is uh, an escalation game based Oracle. So what that means is anyone can ask it a question and anyone else can come along and, and try to answer the question by putting down a bond. You, you uh, put down a bond, uh, set the outcome to whatever you like, and then anyone else can come and double the bond to change the outcome. Each time the bond is set, a timeout it kind of resets. And if at any point you get to the end of the timeout, then the answer is locked in. And so you basically play this escalation game until someone gives up uh, and kind of loses their bonds. And the way that the game theory uh, plays out is at the top of the escalation game, the bonds get so large that people have to coordinate around uh, setting the bonds and thus have to kind of coordinate around which outcome is correct. And so the shelling point for the correct for the correct outcome is the the true outcome. It's much easier to coordinate around a true outcome than a false one. And so at the top of the escalation game, it should always resolve to the true outcome. That being the case, at the kind of bottom, there's very little incentive to set a false outcome uh, because you're essentially just giving money to whoever comes and corrects you. So in practice, we very rarely see it uh, move beyond the first step where someone just comes along and sets the true outcome. I remember, so, so we we did an episode about this in 2014 because it used to be called Reality Keys, and we had like I, I remember first hearing about this thing, and just like this was one of the things that got me like super excited about about the the idea of of, of blockchains and like the types of decentralized sort of autonomous decision making you can make. Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, episode 33 of Epicenter is about this very thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And so like it's it's been been kind of out in the wild for ages, and it's uh it's been used for for things like the the omen prediction market. It's the mechanism for for resolving um uh, the those outcomes for their markets, uh, and was obviously a mechanism that we were we were comfortable with. We had seen work in practice with large volumes of uh, a large amount of money at stake, and so that was the the reason for kind of landing on this. The neat thing with it, and, and kind of, again, part of the reason for this confusing, confusing cacophony of names is that it could be used to bring in decisions from just about anywhere. So we chose Snapshot because 
that pattern of kind of snapshot plus notice of safe was already really common, but you could use it to bring uh, outcomes from say a Discord poll or a discourse poll or a Twitter poll, or you could flip coins and roll dice and, and you know, whatever you want. And it could, you know, as long as there was some reasonably easy way to kind of publicly verify the outcome, then you can uh, use this as a way to kind of bring that information on chain. Um, so yeah, this, this is kind of our first uh, module uh, and, and has, already gotten a, a pretty good bit of adoption and there's a, a whole bunch of projects out in the wild using this as the way of kind of uh, enabling cheap or free kind of voting for their participants, but still kind of autonomous control over their uh, over their uh, assets. Um, the, the next kind of more fundamental building block uh, was essentially a piece that we took from the uh, the first version of the reality module, and it's just a, a delay module. So I talked about uh, compound uh, kind of reviving or reinventing this this kind of centuries old concept of a time lock, and that's essentially what uh, our delay module is. It's just like making a very uh, very small component that you can kind of put between uh, a safe and and other modules just to delay the things that it tries to make happen, and so it creates a really good kind of safety hatch. Uh, for if you want to give you know a, an individual or a small group of people some uh, ability to control uh, the assets on behalf of the safe, maybe to as a way of kind of mitigating the overhead of voting, but you still want to have kind of the security of being able to know that we can stop these things if it turns out that they do something malicious. Then you have some mechanism by which uh, you can decide like what what it takes to override such decisions, like within exactly, that time yeah. delay. Yeah. Yeah, so That's you have cool. this kind of delay period, and then um, there is a, an owner of that kind of delay modifier, and the owner can basically skip any uh, any transaction that gets enqueued. And so, if for whatever reason the owner, which is probably the DAO, it might be some other mechanism, uh, if, if the the owner decides that it's uh, it's malicious, then yeah, you can just trigger a transaction to skip that malicious uh, transaction. Um, then the the next one that we uh, the next module that we worked on is um, this exit module, which essentially adds uh, Moloch-like uh, kind of rage quit functionality. You designate an ERC-20 token and uh, as your kind of organization uh, version of a kind of share, and then users can redeem uh, any amount of that ERC-20 token for a kind of proportional share of the safe's assets. So it allows that the kind of combination of uh, a voting mechanism a delay module and uh, an exit mechanism allow, allows you to create this kind of very Moloch-like organization out of a, a bunch of kind of fundamental pieces. Um, then beyond that, uh, we have a handful of others uh, that we've we've built or, and are kind of currently working on. I'm curious about the bridge module and um, the types of things you can do with the bridge module. Yeah. Okay. That's a, a, a very important omission on my part. Um, so yeah, the bridge module is, uh, is essentially a way of, uh, importing, uh, uh, kind of giving control of a, of a safe to, um, to an address on the other side of a, uh, of a bridge. So essentially the use case that we're imagining here is, um, you have assets on mainnet, but mainnet's too expensive to vote on. So you want to kind of put your, your decision-making mechanism somewhere else, uh, and Gnosis Chain, formerly XDAI, uh, has kind of, I don't know, established itself as a bit of a home for DAOs. The, the DAO house community uh, ecosystem kind of lives there. Colony uh, and all of its DAOs kind of live there. And then there's a whole bunch of, uh, of Aragon DAOs that have been deployed there. The Gardens DAO ecosystem will live there. And so giving those DAOs the ability to uh, control assets on mainnet uh, is kind of a really key uh, piece to kind of allowing them to function in this multi-layer, multi-chain ecosystem. Um, so yeah, essentially the bridge uh, module lets you set an owner and a chain ID and say like, uh, and a, a bridge module contract or a bridge contract and just say messages passed from this chain by this address uh, are allowed to pass through and control the safe, uh, or control the, the avatar uh, contract. In that case, so let's say like in the case of like, um, uh, a contract on the Ethereum mainnet and a um, a controlling address like on XDAI or even Polygon or like some other layer two chain um, does how, how do fees uh, get paid on the mainnet at that point? Because I, I can see like a use case here for DeFi where you might have some liquidity positions or you might have some DeFi positions on mainnet 
um, but you want to control those from a different uh, chain. Um, in in that case, who who pays the fees? Yeah, so I, this very much depends on the the bridge that you're using. In our case, we're using uh, or in the, the examples that we've built out so far, we're using uh, the Gnosis chain uh, arbitrary message bridge. In which case, you uh, on the Gnosis chain side, you would have your kind of DAO, your decision making mechanism, and it would pass a, a message to the A and B contract on the Gnosis chain side. There's a, a bunch of bridge oracles that are watching that, and they would, uh, when they see your message get passed in, they would then kind of race to add signatures to it. Once you have a threshold of signatures from then, you take that and you call and execute uh, signatures function on the mainnet side, and you pass in those signatures as a parameter. So someone needs to take that, but it's a uh, it's a public function. Uh, so all you need to do is have the signatures, and you can trigger execution on the other side. Um, yeah, there's for the route like uh, Gnosis chain to mainnet, uh, you have to pay for it, or someone has to pay for it. Going the other way, uh, it's it's subsidized because it's it's trivial uh, the the cost, but because the costs on mainnet are, are much less predictable, then it's uh, it's harder to kind of subsidize. Longer term, what we're really hoping to uh, to develop and to see. Um, see the kind of use case being is DAOs that essentially choose a, a chain as their their kind of home chain, but then are able to spin up a Gnosis safe on kind of each and every other EVM compatible chain and bridge decisions to them. So their their influence can kind of extend a long way beyond their chosen home chain. Uh, a, a DAO on Gnosis chain might control a safe on mainnet and one on Polygon and Optimism and Arbitrum and and you know anywhere else that the safe ecosystem is deployed to. Interesting. So with, with this you know, recent, I guess like in the last year or so, there's just like been a proliferation of EVM compatible chains or, or layer twos. And how, how do you foresee DAOs, um, like very much in, in the spirit of what you just said, like how, how do you foresee DAOs uh, sort of spreading across those ecosystems? And what what's that going to look like? Like, I don't know, let's say you you know, you have like, uh, I don't know, Flamingo DAO, right? Okay, well, you know, it's on mainnet and it also wants to be on these other ecosystems. Um, what's that going to look like for users? And also, you know, perhaps technically, like what kind of control mechanisms would they want to implement? Would it be like centrally, um, like centrally managed from one chain, then sort of like managing uh, those kind of sub DAOs or like DAOs on other chains, or are they all operating sort of horizontally at the same level? Sure. So I think as with all DAOs, because it's a wide open organizational design space at the moment, there's not necessarily like one pattern or one design path that I think all DAOs will assume. Other than the fact that I do strongly believe that most DAOs will be multi-chain. So I could see some example where a DAO, um, particularly an art collecting DAO or a social DAO, um, maybe wants to have a presence on multiple EBM chains because maybe um, an artist they're collecting is primarily based on Polygon. They do governance layer on Gnosis chain, and then they secure their most um, kind of larger assets on mainnet. And I think it would be really good also as a kind of like ambassador function for different DAOs who have presence on different chains and communicate between them, because at each you'll find different communities and different kind of tool sets, and also strengthen um, the resiliency of the bridges between them, both on a technical and also a kind of community level. And even, um, so I'm on the board of Regen Foundation, which is Regen Network as a Cosmos SDK chain. Um, for ecosystem services. And we've even been talking Shout with out the to Greg. kind of Yeah. And I we've even been talking with the Evmos team about seeing about getting uh, Zodiac tools kind of deployed there. And um, I think really this kind of multi-chain presence will be hugely beneficial to the ecosystem and also basically allow kind of different participants, and I prefer the term like participant over user, um, basically like different types of accessibility. Um, so for, say, their Regen Network, Regen Foundation, community staking DAOs, we'll have all different levels of kind of access and familiarity with protocol governance, but we can really have the patterns and kind of acclimate to them and meet people where they're at, especially if it's kind of chain-specific applications or chain-specific usability. So you think that then th there may be like uh, some some functions of the DAO that would exist on one chain and some of the functions would exist on another chain and you may have like you know, assets being managed like on on different chains and and I, I, I guess then that begs my next question is like, what is the what do you foresee as the sort of role of Gnosis Chain 
as a as a as a as a place where you know lots of people are hosting DAOs, do you think that like DAOs are, are becoming or will become one of the predominant use cases uh, for Gnosis Chain? So I think we've already seen that there and that the XDAI ecosystem has been really thriving with teams mentioned before like DAO House as well as the Gardens DAO and OneHive communities. So in a way it already is very much a kind of DAO oriented chain. We also have things like circles which use the safe contracts at their core. Um, so there is very much an idea of kind of like collective accounts being the identity standard on Gnosis Chain. Um, so I can very much see it progressing in this manner and even but also in the sense that I really believe that DAO should be multi-chain, so I wouldn't want it to become a kind of monopolistic um, chain specifically focused on DAOs. And I think part of this can be shown in the ethos of also um, Gnosis Chain trying to make it very easy for people who wish to, to be able to um, host their own node. So working with Node and others, and the way we started the conversation about chains kind of being their own DAOs, I think Gnosis Chain would ideally like to kind of operate in that manner as well, where there's a really kind of decentralized ownership of the chain itself and very strong cross-chain community as well. So taking a step back here and, and uh, coming back to sort of like, you know, DAOs as paradigms in, in uh, you know, in society, I, I wonder what types of, you know, existing structures you think are um, ripe for transformation or transition uh, into like DAO form. It, Sure. So I think one we already touched on and co-ops, but I don't know if it's necessarily from the kind of theory of change where it's like co-ops themselves transform into DAOs, but more that these kind of principles of existing organizations become more familiar among our ecosystem. Um, I also think one thing that DAOs happen to be very good at at the moment <laughs> and often not always to the best ends is uh, pooling capital um, or pooling some type of resources. So, I laugh because I'm thinking of Spice Dow, which recently bought some IP, um, or I thought they bought some IP. Um, <laughs> but um, but they tend to be good vehicles. You see Constitution Dow. You also think see things like Climate Dow, and I think that there needs to be a lot more thoughtful consideration around the kind of what you would call Dow governance or corporate governance of these vehicles. But you see it already. I saw emerge yesterday like a Hoddle Dow, which is aiming to be. Um, like a, a PAC, so a political action committee, specifically to um, look at US regulatory landscape and crypto and specifically kind of advise um, policy positions. So basically looking at these organizations that often need a certain amount of capital um, to be bootstrapped and to be effective, uh, DAOs are very um, kind of natural tools for these organizations, right? Um, in terms of having the best possible outcomes, we also see this with things like the Free Assange DAO and other um, things of basically being able to kind of quickly bootstrap resources to a narrowly scoped cause. Um, but I think, and what I'm hoping for is that it becomes more variegated where we aren't necessarily looking at financial capital of the resource that's easily pooled, um, but as more kind of different, um, I mean, this is a, a somewhat uh, cringe and complicated term, but natural capital or other forms of capital um, become legible on chain they can be really good ways um, to confer mutual aid for different communities, or to confer a kind of large amounts of access um, to different people, not only kind of gathering, but also distributing. So I think kind of next gen DAOs will have to focus more on the distribution rather than the kind of um, gathering. Talking about distribution, I think like one of the, you know, if you, you one of the things here that comes to my mind is, um, you know, how DAOs can, uh, sort of distribute uh, capital in you know the, the the real economy, right? So like you know, the 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 uh, the friction between like the crypto economy and like traditional banking still remains. Um, and I think like sh if there was less friction there, it would be easier for DAOs to you know perhaps finance. Um, a lot more things, sort of like outside of the, you know the crypto ecosystem, which is like I think a lot of DAOs are um, are are helping to contribute to and finance today. Um, what what are some ways that we can hope to see DAOs uh, have an improved or like a, a, a yeah improved interaction with the real economy and like what are some of the barriers there that need to be broken down and um, for like a more generalized uh, type of uh, application. Yeah, I mean, I think um, in terms of barriers that need to be broken down, there's just uh, 
relatively few uh, established kind of pathways for for essentially legal personhood for a DAO uh, or, or you know, the ability for a for a DAO to um, to kind of tangibly own real world assets or interact with with the real world. Um, that says there is a, a handful of uh, I guess trailblazers of, of DAOs that have gone out and actually kind of established some kind of uh, real world real world entity that uh, that's uh, kind of wrapping or otherwise kind of interacting with the DAO. Um, and then also a handful that have kind of explicitly gone the other direction and and become these uh, kind of uh, illegal entities uh, and kind of define very uh, very you know well structured participation agreements between members uh, to to account for the fact that they are deliberately not seeking kind of incorporation or, or seeking kind of recognition by one jurisdiction explicitly. I think. Um, there's well, there's been some really great efforts by um, by you know, again a whole bunch of different uh, actors. One in particular has been really cool as the uh, the koala model law, uh, which is kind of seeking to uh, create a, a, a model law that different jurisdictions can kind of adopt uh, in order to to find a kind of common ground on how to treat uh, these these kind of illegal DAOs. Um, so. Probably some jurisdictions starting to uh, adopt that or something similar to that as a as a really great first step to enabling kind of really widespread uh, uh, kind of legal personification or at least kind of legal interaction uh, or interaction between kind of DAOs and, and a lot of the kind of real world, but uh, also in, in terms of kind of people trailblazing or projects trailblazing. There's projects like. Uh, uh, Opolis and, and Spork DAO that have uh, kind of gone the opposite direction and very kind of explicitly said let's uh, let's kind of set up uh, Colorado limited cooperatives, uh, limited cooperative associations, and, and actually kind of bake those uh, bake the kind of the mechanisms of the kind of DAO structures that we create into the uh, into our operating agreements, and then bake uh, the the constraints of the DAO into or the constraints of the um, the, the legal kind of uh, wrapper that we're choosing into our, our kind of DAO structures and, and kind of try to marry the two. Uh, and yeah, I, I don't know that one is necessarily the, the kind of right or the wrong way to do it. It's, it's interesting to see kind of both, both threads being pushed forward in parallel by different groups. Uh, and I think there's, there's probably I don't know, pros and cons of both. Uh, obviously, the, the idea of uh, spinning up a legal wrapper probably gives you more immediate access to real world things than, uh, than the alternative where you're kind of waiting on on some jurisdiction to to uh, create some kind of recognition. Yeah, I mean, I I think the legal wrapper uh, that, that that some people and then like law firms have been able to sort of come up with is you know perhaps like a, a stepping stone to something that's uh, a lot more uh, um, uh, a lot more organic to the to the to the DAO um, mod like structure and like to the functioning of a DAO and so like the, that paradigm um and so I think like what what's going on in Wyoming is probably like the most interesting uh, are, are there other places that uh that you're aware of where um jurisdiction like that the or other jurisdictions that have uh started discussing or are looking into um you know DAO personhood yeah, I know the uh, folks at Opolis um, are, are working pretty hard with the legislators in uh, Colorado to set up something pretty similar. Um, I, I say similar, and they'd probably be scowling at me now for saying similar because I think there's, there's a whole bunch of uh, issues that they see with the uh, with the Wyoming legislation and and uh, a lot of what they're doing in uh, in Colorado is is kind of a direct response to that. Um, but yeah, I guess kind of the the, the goal was to create kind of uh, yeah an outcome where where DAOs can have a, uh, a reasonable kind of legal personification um, that uh, I guess mirrors the the kind of um, value assumptions that that a lot of Web three organizations make or, or they kind of has has the similar kind of value alignment um, I guess another example that I'm aware of is um, the uh, Vermont legislation, which actually was preceded Wyoming as well, uh, the Vermont's blockchain-based LLC, 
uh, is another kind of legal uh, wrapper that you can spin up for, for similar purposes. Uh, Diog uh, kind of pioneered that. Um, and uh, I think maybe like in, in both of those cases, in, in the Vermont case and the Wyoming case, uh, they really just kind of show the kind of flexibility of LLCs in general. Like really you can, you can, make an LLC, you can kind of, you can construct an LLC that does just about whatever you want. And so it's more about, uh, I think how much, uh, how willing you are to go and do the kind of bespoke work to, to create an LLC that functions as you want it to. Yeah. I think, I think in Europe, uh, you know, it's, it's probably a little bit more complex than I've been, I've been talking with people who are trying to find ways to, um, to f- create some form of wrapper that would allow like you know DAOs to have legal personhood but it's not quite there yet and i don't think that it's there you know europe will be at the forefront of uh, of this innovation typically the way that i've seen people approach it in in europe um has been through like a foundation model right where you would have uh, i think generally people like to or tend to prefer like a swiss foundation um, but there's a handful of other jurisdictions where people would spin up some kind of foundation and uh, that foundation would kind of have no direct tie to the DAO itself, but would be kind of uh, as part of its operating agreement, uh, bound to decisions made by the DAO, bound to act in the best interest of the DAO and would usually just kind of act on behalf of the DAO as opposed to being kind of directly tied to it in the way that the uh, the blockchain LLC, uh, blockchain um based LLC or the Wyoming DAO uh, or this kind of up and coming um, uh, Colorado based uh, uh, legal wrapper would aim to kind of more directly marry the two. Mm. Yeah, no, I mean, like the Swiss Foundation models, I think has has been great for for a lot of organizations and lots of DAOs. I'm 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 speaking more specifically about like the 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 Eurozone um, because yeah, it, it, there there are some barriers I think still like for. You know, DAOs that um, need to operate and you know, sort of like be fiscally tied to uh, to to the eurozone, uh, being being in Switzerland. So I, I'm I'm hopeful that that things will will come out of the eurozone soon. As we as we wrap up here, like um, what uh, what kinds of things are you most excited about? You know, uh, sort of like upcoming things that you see um, in the you know, sort of DAO tooling space and um, you know where where do you think like DAO cooperation and organizations will be in like four or five years from now, as we look back? Sure. So I know one thing as a team we're really excited about is taking private voting to DAOs. Um, we've seen that both in the kind of bidding and voting process that privacy is really fundamentally important to any kind of voting or decision making process, especially at scale. Um, so we're excited about Macy and um, using zero knowledge proofs basically to bring private voting to DAOs. And I think that that will exponentially kind of explode um, the decision making and kind of realms that DAOs operate in because you have a fundamentally different dynamic and one that is fundamentally more aligned with our existing kind of um, political and legislative systems. Uh, so that's super exciting. I'm also um, very keen on a kind of token design space and token experimentation. And whether that's on a specific contract level or a token standards level, I'm somewhat ambivalent about, but we've seen a lot of emphasis put on coin voting, right, for DAOs. And my feeling is that we've kind of fallen into this pattern primarily because it was the easiest way to gather a signal from a large amount of people or a large amount of holders um, that you believe uh, are some way invested in the outcome of this decision. And that it happened kind of almost by default as a way to easily signal large groups. And now we've seen the kind of pitfalls and kind of collusion, as well as um, just general social norms that coin voting produces. It's fundamentally plutocratic governance. Um, so I think as we think more about tokens as um, separate, kind of unbundling them from voting rights, um, we can look at them as kind of one person, one vote, and other governance rights. Um, and also basically, yeah, plus coin voting is cheap civil resistance. So there's questions of how we design civil resistance and other things into basic. Um, kind of voting systems and whether it's token design of thinking through tokens as governance rights, but also thinking through tokens as something potentially very different, not even reputation, something else that like doesn't exist or doesn't have a kind of clear analog in our current political systems. I'm really excited to see what could come from there. And yeah, the general forms of decision making that that produces um, between private voting 
and kind of non-coin voting alternatives on cheaper chains um, will be amazing. Yeah, I, I mirror that. Really excited to see kind of secret voting start to uh, start to take off, start to be more accessible. Uh, hopefully, we can help. Uh, we we have a a really strong desire to help. You know fix that problem, help, uh, help you know, bring that into the world. I think the other thing that I'm excited about is, is what I talked about at the start, like this, this design space of uh, having desired outcomes be the kind of emergent result of uh, uncoordinated inputs. Uh, so mechanisms like quadratic funding uh, that, that enable that uh, across a variety of different contexts. So really excited to see that design space kind of take off, uh, see what other problems people are able to solve uh, without uh, resorting to kind of explicit coordination around those problems. Uh, we, we see a lot of discussion in the, uh, the DAO space about kind of defeating Moloch and, and usually people's suggestions to defeating Moloch means stacking more coordination on top of, uh, on top of situations or solutions, uh, which is uh, kind of paradoxical because obviously Moloch is the god of coordination failure. You know, so the more the more kind of layers of coordination you have, the more opportunity there is for failure of that coordination. And so I think like designing systems that explicitly uh, require uncoordinated inputs uh, or, or kind of create the outcome that you want from uncoordinated inputs is uh, is is the real key to us actually defeating Moloch. Yeah, I'd like to add a short thing to that. I think it's really interesting. Um, I, I think also, and a little bit less of a kind of automated um, approach, but still really relevant. If you look at earlier tools for online voting, like Lumio, per se, that were developed by a kind of decentralized network of people, um, it was funny chatting with the Lumio co-founder, um, Rob, because he said basically um, he considers kind of voting like the last ditch attempt at a group of people to come to consensus. Like if you have to actually take something to a vote, it means that there's um, a basically dissensus among the group. Uh, so by, by, I love the framing of like uncoordinated inputs and the kind of potential actions. Also, I think there's too much emphasis potentially put on a coordination problem because coordination can lead to equally ill ends. Um, so basically how we, like we need more tools to come to kind of coherent cultural consensus and then explicitly make those actions happen and there doesn't always need to be a vote or explicit kind of formal recognition in between that, except in the kind of um, historical lens of how that decision came to be. Uh, so I really appreciate more fuzziness brought into kind of um, decentralized autonomous systems to come. That's that's a really that's really interesting and a great note to uh, to end on. And um, but before we before we go, um, where can people find out more about uh, Gnosis Guild and Zodiac and all the tools that uh, you've built? And um, yeah, just get get more involved with uh, everything that you guys are doing. Sure. So you can find us uh, on Twitter at Gnosis Guild, and we also have a blog GnosisGuild.mirror.xyz where we publish about the products we're updating as well as just general thoughts on DAOs and coordination. Um, we're also in the midst of working on a Gnosis Guild wiki, which will house basically all of our product documentation and DAO approach, but also have a section of the wiki that aims to collate a lot of DAO best practices or kind of a DAO pattern language of basically how people, if they find themselves in certain situations with DAOs, e.g., um, you know, your DAO is at this size, you're using these tools, what are good patterns and voting tools and decision-making mechanisms you can use. And we'd actually like to open up this wiki to other community contributors and the ecosystem at large. So if that sounds like a project that um, any listener is interested in, definitely get in touch about that and it'll be allowed to. Great, and we'll link to all of that and uh, your fantastic writing uh, in the show notes. Aaron and uh, Kia, thanks so much for joining me today. It's been a fascinating conversation and uh, hope to have you on again at some point. Cheers. Thanks for having us, Sebastian. Thank you. Super lovely.